Hey, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on Reason and Theology. I'm a little under the weather still, so bear with me as I uh, push through this stream. Um, <clears throat> I want to go over some news related to the German bishops and Pope Francis. Um, I'm going to be reviewing a <clears throat> article put out by The Pillar called German Bishop Asks Pastor or Pastors to bless same-sex couples. It was posted uh, about three days ago. And so this is another development to the situation that has um, been going on in the church for several years now. You'll recall that there were, uh, you know, years ago, a number of years ago, uh, bishops who were pushing for blessing of same-sex unions. The Vatican came out with a document in 2021 um, saying, no, you, you can't bless sin. And so any, any discussion of blessing the union, a disordered union, um, just simply can't be done because God cannot bless sin, and therefore the church cannot bless sin. And, of course, this was approved by Pope Francis, so it's authoritative, magisterial. Uh, it's not just Pope Francis's opinion. <clears throat> he puts his actual authority behind it. That's 2021. Now, You'll recall in 2022, Flemish bishops uh, began to uh, promote the notion uh, that they are going to bless same-sex unions, despite Rome saying, no, you can't do that. And also the German bishops uh, following suit have been pushing for um, blessing same-sex um, <clears throat> unions, contrary to what the magisterium has decided. And you know, I even reviewed on a show where the German bishops released a document effectively thumbing their nose at the magisterium, just completely saying, eh, doesn't matter. We know that we're not in, in, in line with the magisterium, and we're still going to move forward with this. It was incredible. So um, that took place, and as you all know, um, Pope Francis was asked in July by a number of cardinals, um, once again, <clears throat> on the question of blessing same-sex unions. Pope Francis responded to them. Uh, it was a private correspondence, but he responded to them and he let them know that um, we cannot bless unions. We can bless individuals um, for them to live a life of holiness, but we can't bless any disordered union. So Pope Francis reconfirmed that. Unfortunately, a lot of people twisted what he said and created all kinds of artificial confusion, both in Catholic media and the secular world, uh, saying that Pope Francis opened the door to blessing same-sex unions, when in fact it, that that's not what he did. Um, so there was that that we covered. And now... Uh, this German bishop issues a letter um, last Thursday asking pastors in his diocese to bless same-sex couples. Um, so that is the most recent development here. Let me go ahead and share my screen so we can follow along with this. Um, so this bishop in Germany, Bishop Karl Heinz Weissmann of Spire, Germany, is the one who is... Uh, part of this uh, discussion. He's the one who is giving the green light to this. Bishop Carl Heinz Weissman, in the November 2nd letter to priests, deacons, and lay pastoral workers, um, or said in this letter that the blessings, which he also extended to remarried couples, could take place in churches in the Diocese of Spire. The ceremony must differ from a church wedding ceremony in terms of words and signs and should explicitly, now here's a kicker, reinforce the love commitment, love, commitment, and mutual responsibility in the couple's relationship as an act of blessing, he said in the 1,000 word letter. So <clears throat> what is the bishop arguing for? What is he giving a green light to? Well, as I said, um, you know, some people 
disguise certain things in very cunning ways. And I have been hammering home. Here's how they're going to try to sell it. They're going to try to sell it as, well, we're not blessing sin and anything disordered in this union. We're just blessing whatever good is found in this union, such as monogamy, commitment, friendship. We're just blessing the good found there, not the bad. You see the way that they're going to try to couch it. And in fact, we're seeing him couching it in just that way. And you've, you're probably familiar with what my response has been to that, which it's exactly what the magisterium actually said in response, um, as we'll look at here in a moment. My response has always been, <clears throat> you can't isolate any good that you find, such as fidelity and commitment. You can't isolate them from the context in which they are found. So, in other words, we can speak of commitment, fidelity, friendship, isolated, objectively speaking, these are goods, right? But we live in reality. We don't live in the world of ideas, Plato's ethereal realm of ideas, where you have these ideals, friendship, fidelity, commitment, just floating around there in outer space, right? We live in reality, where these things take place in concrete contexts. And you can't divorce those things that are good in and of themselves from the context in which they're found. So if there is a um, rapist who is very committed, he is so committed to raping people. He's committed. He has zeal. He has passion. He is committed to raping people. Now, you, you might say, well, commitment in and of itself is a good thing, right? I mean, passion, zeal, those sound like good virtues, right? Sure, if, if we're just considering them, you know, <clears throat> isolated. Sorry, like I said, I'm still getting over this sickness. You know, if you consider them isolated, you know, co commitment might be a good thing, but... It, Commitment in the context to doing something contrary to the moral order and, and contrary to the legal system as well. Okay, commitment in that context is not a good thing, right? So I've, I've given another example. There are some people out there who love their demon god Baal. You know, they're so committed to their demon god Baal that they slit their wrists. For their demon god all right we've read about this in scripture they slit the wrist for their demon god because they are so committed to the worship of baal now again commitment in and of itself is a good thing but commitment to a demon god okay in that context commitment's not a good thing right this is just very basic stuff so you see how they're trying to couch this. Oh, well, we're just blessing the good found in this disordered union. We're not blessing anything bad. We're just blessing love, he says, commitment and mutual responsibility. Responsibility? First of all, love. Love is willing the good of the other. They're harming each other, so they're not actually loving each other. Commitment, sure, two people in a same-sex union might be committed, but they're committed to living a sinful lifestyle. So commitment here, not something that we want to bless. Mutual responsibility, well, it's not responsible to do something contrary to the moral order, and that is not good for the other or for themselves. Certainly, it's not responsible to do something that is offensive to God. So... Um, you know, talking about blessing, love, commitment, mutual responsibility, but we're not going to bless anything sinful. Well, that only works if you isolate these things 
in Plato's realm of ideas, but it doesn't work when you actually put them into the concrete circumstances of a disordered relationship. You can't bless those things. Thus, the church cannot bless any alleged love, commitment, or mutual responsibility. Let me give you one more example before I point you to what the magisterium says that backs me up. Um, you know, there I'm I'm sure you can find some wild people out there uh who, who love Satan. You know, they, they exist. They exist. I you can find somebody out there who's so dedicated to Satan that they would undergo some kind of marriage ceremony to Lucifer, right? You there you can't tell me these people don't exist. Obviously, they exist. Of course they exist. There's somebody out there who's willing to do this, right? Okay, well, let's say this person says, look, I am so committed to Lucifer. I'm so committed to Satan that I will never, ever, 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 ever worship anyone other than Satan. You know, I'm committed to worshiping him and him alone. I won't wor worship Baal. I won't worship Molech. I won't worship Yahweh. I'm just going to worship Lucifer. And I'm committed to him. And I'm faithful to him. Could the church bless the good found in that union, such as commitment, commitment to their love of Satan? Can can we bless the good found there? No, that's stupid, right? That's that's just dumb, right? Because you can't talk about commitment somehow ignoring the context in which it's in. A commitment to sin is not a good thing. So commitment to what? Mutual responsibility for what? For preserving a disordered union? Love. Love for what? We have to ask those questions. Love for what? Commitment for what? Responsibility to what? If it's to sin, then you can't bless it. So this doesn't work. Because where does this end? It doesn't, it, it could literally end with us saying, you know what? Okay. Let's consider, let's consider Satan. Okay. Satan is a being. Sure. God created him. He's a creature. He's a being. Um, the way in which he exists is completely disordered. It is completely contrary to the will of God. Everything about him. He is fixated on doing the exact opposite of what he should do. So he exists. He has being. But how is he existing? How is he being? Well, his existence is ordered to disorder. He's choosing to live disorder. So while we can speak of existence in and of itself, in Catholic philosophy as a good, we can speak of being as a good. You still have to ask, how is one existing? How is one being? Somebody might philosophically say, well, existence is a good. Therefore, Satan's existence is good. Isolated from what Satan does. Yeah, existence is good, but. How is he existing? Not in a good way. He's not using existence and his being consistent with his nature. He's not. He's going contrary to it. So could you have a priest who comes along and says, I am going to bless the existence of Satan. I just won't bless any disordered activity that Satan engages in, but we're going to now offer this liturgical blessing for the existence of Satan because existence is a good. So can we now start to have liturgical blessings for Satan? Well, if you buy into this bishop's understanding of isolating goods from their context, yes, there's nothing to stop this bishop from coming with a blessing for Satan. They could just say, you know what? I'm not blessing any any sinful things that Satan does, but I'm just going to bless his existence. This is stupid. It, it's not hard. 
you simply have to consider these whatever virtues, whatever goods we're talking about, you have to consider them in their context. And then you say, ah, if they're being abused and they're disordered, no, we cannot bless these things, which is exactly what the magisterium said in 2021, as I'm about to show you, which means this German bishop, Bishop Karl Heinz Weissmann, is going exactly contrary to what Pope Francis has said twice now. Two times, not once, but two times. Count it. One, two, twice. Now, we're going to talk about Pope Francis here in a moment. What might he do in response to this? But let, let's, let's first establish the fact that the magisterium has already ruled out what this bishop is attempting to do. Look at this part from the 2021 response. Again, this is from 2021 CDF, response to the dubia on the blessing of unions of the persons of same sex, where the Pope rules uh, through the CDF that the church cannot bless sin. All right? Cannot bless sin. We can bless sinful man, but we cannot bless sin. For the above reasons, the church does not and cannot have the power to bless unions of persons of the same sex in the sense intended above. Okay. Now, there's a key paragraph here that directly excludes what the German bishop is trying to do here. Once again, I will remind you the German bishop here, Karl Heinz Weissmann, is saying that the blessing is to reinforce the love, commitment, and mutual responsibility in the couple's relationship. So he's not saying, hey, I'm going to bless sin in this union. He's saying, I'm going to bless the good found in this union, such as love, commitment, and mutual responsibility. But the CDF explicitly rejects that view for the exact same reason that I just told you. Watch what it says. For this reason, it is not licit to impart a blessing on relationships or partnerships. <clears throat> even staple that involves sexual activity outside of marriage, outside the indissoluble union of a man and a woman open in itself to the transmission of life. As in the case of unions between persons of the same sex. Watch this part. Here, here's the key. Here's the key. Sorry, I'm going to put this cough drop in my mouth. It might, it might help me a little bit. The presence in some relationships of positive elements. Okay, so we're literally talking exactly about what the German bishop is trying to do. The presence in some relationships of positive elements, which are in and of themselves, in themselves to be valued and appreciated. You know, existing in Plato's ethereal realm of ideas, isolated, considered objectively, these ideals are good, they're positive elements, they're, they're valued and appreciated. However, the presence in some relationships of positive elements, which are in, in, them, in, in themselves to be valued and appreciated, cannot justify these relationships and render them legitimate objects of ecclesial blessing, since the positive elements exist within the context of a union not ordered to the creator's plan. Thank you. Thank you. The magisterium has been saying exactly what I was saying. Exactly. The same thing. You can't take these things and isolate them. You have to consider them in their context. In this context, it's being disordered. So while you could speak of virtues in and of themselves being valued and appreciated, you cannot say that this is now an object of blessing because it exists in this particular context, which is disordered and is not a union order to the creator's plan. So you can't have this. So again, what the German bishop is doing here is explicitly, not implicitly, explicitly condemned by Rome, by the magisterium. So what the bishop is doing 
is he is currently in descent from the magisterium. He is not doing this in conjunction with the magisterium. He's not finding a loophole. He's not saying, oh, well, it didn't say anything about this, so let me sneak it in. No, he's not. He's doing this explicitly contrary to what the CDF has said. Maybe he doesn't even know that the CDF has said this. I don't know. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Who knows? But if he doesn't, it's his job to know. So he's still accountable for it. Either way. So even if he doesn't know that he's going against the 2021 directive, which is very hard to believe, but somehow giving him the benefit of the doubt, even if he doesn't know, well, he's culpable for that because this is his job. It's, it's like a police officer who doesn't know the very basics of policing. It's kind of your job to know this. So if you go out and do something as a police officer that gets someone killed because you don't know what your own police department tells you you should do in this situation, that's on you. And you're responsible for that person's death because you should know better. So likewise, a bishop, which again, I find it hard to believe that he wouldn't know that he's explicitly violating 2021. But if for some reason that's the case, he's still accountable. He's still responsible. And, 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 if, and if he doesn't know, he shouldn't even be a bishop. Because if, if you don't know the very basics of, of what the magisterium is putting out, what, why are you a bishop? And if you do know and you're just choosing to go against the magisterium, you shouldn't be a bishop anyway. So no matter how this thing shakes down, Bishop Karl Heinz Weissman is not fit to be a bishop. He should not be in that office. Now, God in his providence has allowed him to be in that in that office. I recognize that. I recognize that. There are people who hold offices that God has allowed them to attain that office, but they're not personally qualified for it. Might this be one of those cases? I don't know. I just showed you the facts. So, yes, he is a bishop. Yes, we can respect his office. But it doesn't seem that he should be in that role. Now, let's continue with the article before we discuss Pope Francis himself. Local Catholic media said that Weissman was the first German bishop to make such an appeal. Though other prelates have stressed previously that pastors will face no sanctions for blessing same-sex and remarried couples in their dioceses. Weissman, who has led the diocese in southwest Germany since 2008, said he was issuing the invitation after 93% of participants in the country's controversial synodal way endorsed a document calling for blessing ceremonies for couples who love each other. And you remember I reviewed that document. And I showed you that document that he's relying on explicitly and knowingly goes against the magisterium. That's what's so amazing here. The German bishops at this conference and in the document adopted a document that itself explicitly notes it's not in accord with the magisterium. So again, they're, they're just thumbing their nose at the magisterium saying, ah, well, Rome says that, but we don't care. We're just going to do our own thing. And so he's basing this on a document that is in descent from the magisterium over and, over and against what the magisterium has authoritatively declared. So there is no legitimate basis for what Bishop Weissman is doing. Zero. None. It's not only contrary to the magisterium, but frankly, it is contrary to common sense. It's um, <clears throat> it, it would be as stupid as saying, Bishop, I want you to bless the commitment that this pedophile has to pedophilia. Come, come and bless this, please. Don't bless the sin of pedophilia, but just bless his commitment to pedophilia. That's stupid. And, and I hope that the bishop would agree, yeah, that's stupid. Okay. But that's the same stupid reasoning behind this other blessing. It's the same thing. So it's just contrary to common sense. So you don't even need the magisterium to tell you this is wrong. 
it's just kind of it's it's kind of laughable at this point. Does the magisterium really have to tell you this? <laughs> you know, the, does the magisterium really have to come out and explain to you? Hey, it's not a good idea to bless a commitment to sin. I, I kind of feel like we don't need the magisterium for that. I kind of feel like we just need to use our own braids, right? <laughs> just common sense here. <laughs> I, I feel like the magisterium should only kick in on those issues that are really complex. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe we're discussing some intricacy of eschatology. And, and, and we need the magisterium to kick in here. Okay. But this... This is just contrary to common sense. It's ridiculous. So <clears throat> that leads me to believe that people who are promoting this, um, I think they're doing so intentionally. I think what it is, is because it's so contrary to common sense and the magistrate, I think what they're doing is they've already committed themselves to this position. They start with the commitment to, I want to bless this thing. And then they look for some way to make that work. Regardless of what common sense says, regardless of what the magisterium says, they look for some way to make it work. I think that's what it is. Or some people are just really bad thinkers. And really can't think through a very basic issue like this. And if that's the case, they shouldn't be a bishop, should they? No. No, they shouldn't. I don't know which is worse. You can't think through really basic concepts. Or you've started with a disordered position and you're looking to justify it. I don't know which is worse. But I do know either way one should not be a bishop. Um, let's continue with the article. The text called for the creation of a handout <clears throat> for use in German dioceses that included suggested forms for blessing celebrations for various couples' situations, remarried couples, same-sex couples, couples after civil marriage. Weissman wrote, both with regard to believers whose marriages have broken down and who have remarried, and especially with regard to same-sex-oriented people. It is urgently time, especially against the background of a long history of deep hurt, for a different perspective to find a pastoral attitude inspired by the gospel, as many of you have been practicing for a long time. Okay. All right. Well, there's nothing wrong with addressing people's deep hurts and needs and bringing them the gospel. But two things here. It does not logically follow that you bless their disordered union because of that. So I don't know how we connected that dot. We doesn't logically follow. Uh, and number two, if we are going to be inspired by the gospel. He says he wants to find a pastoral attitude inspired by the gospel. Aha. Uh -huh. You mean that gospel that says repent of your sins? The gospel that says go and sin no more? Mm -hmm. If you have a pastoral attitude inspired by the gospels, then you won't bless sin. And you also won't bless any good in and of itself considered in a disordered union because in such cases it is no good. It's disordered. So I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. You know, there's people who are deeply hurt and so we need to engage in a pastoral attitude inspired by the gospel and handle accordingly. Uh, okay. How does that get us to blessing this it doesn't and number two if you really meant that then you should be inspired by the very gospel that says 
repent of your sins and believe the gospel. Turn away from your sins. Go and sin no more. You know, those who are walking in sin do not know God. And it leads to death and destruction. Where's the pastoral sensitivities to their eternal soul? So I'm all about being pastoral, dealing with people's deep hurt. I'm all about being welcoming to the people, not to the sin, to the people. So I'm not buying this. This just sounds like rhetoric to me. He says, that's why I campaigned for a reassessment of homosexuality and church teaching in the synodal way. And also voted for the possibility of blessing ceremonies for same-sex couples. I stand by that. I hope that on the path of the global synod, this presiding question of our time can also experience positive development. Okay. What's missing here? You know what's missing? Any kind of awareness of what the word of God says on this subject on part of the bishop. Not to mention a lack of common sense and awareness of the magisterium or an accounting of the magisterium. But where, where's his awareness of scripture on this subject? All of this talk about synodal way and blah, 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 and pastoral, blah, 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 blah. Where's divine revelation in any of this? Isn't divine revelation supposed to be what guides our pastoral care? Where's that in here? That is what should be guiding our pastoral care of souls. And I don't see that anywhere in here. So when you're no longer tethered to scripture in your pastoral care, what are you going to be tethered to? Probably the ways of the world. Probably whatever the world is telling you. And so you're going to be just all over the place. A reed shaking in the wind, as scripture says. Just going to and fro and telling people whatever tickles their ears, as the scriptures say. But when you're tethered to the scriptures themselves, to the word of God, to divine revelation, you're not going to talk this way. You will certainly talk about being pastoral and caring and loving, but it will be in light of divine revelation. That is what guides us here. And I see it entirely missing from the German bishops in their discussions on these subjects. You, you will not find these guys accounting for scripture in their discussions and in their positions. It's just not there. It's painfully obvious. Well, it continues. A report issued October 28 at the end of the Senate on Synodality's first session did not mention same-sex blessings or even the acronym LGBT. But Pope, but Pope Francis addressed the topic of blessings in a reply to five dubia or doubts posed by cardinals ahead of the assembly, um, which I know I've covered it many, many, many times. Here he says, pastoral prudence must therefore properly discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more people. So we're talking about blessing people, not a union, that do not convey a misconception of marriage. And now what kind of blessing are we talking about? Well, he says here, because when a blessing is requested, it is a request for help from God, a plea to live better, a trust in a father who can help us live better. So it is a blessing to live a holier life. So we're talking about blessing persons to live a holier life, not blessing a union as God's approval for the disordered union. So Pope Francis is not confirming what the German bishops are saying. In fact, he takes a shot at them in this. Um, so it's very clear. Nothing in here gives license to what the bishop in Germany is doing. And what Pope Francis has said in 2021 still stands. It hasn't been reversed. You cannot bless the disordered union or any goods found in it because they can't be isolated from the context of the union that is not ordered to the creator's plan. So there's just no way that one can do this. The Pope said it was a matter of pastoral prudence to properly discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more people that do not convey a misconception of marriage, decisions that may be part of pastoral prudence in certain cases need not to be transformed into a norm. In other words, it is not appropriate for a diocese 
a conference of bishops, or any ecclesial structure to authorize constantly and officially proceedings or procedures or rules for every type of affair. Germany is not the only country where bishops have encouraged same-sex blessings. The Flemish bishops in neighboring Belgium authorized a text allowing for a ritual blessing of same-sex couples in September of 2022, which, again, this is after the 2021 decision, so contrary to the magisterium. And in this 2022 uh, approval of the Flemish bishops, note this, in the preamble to the prayer that they use, the bishops wrote, <clears throat> During pastoral meetings, the request is often made for a moment of prayer to ask God that he may bless and perpetuate this commitment of love and fidelity. There it is again. Interesting, right? There it is again. So already in 2022, the Flemish bishops were trying to use this, uh, this argument of we're not blessing the sin found in the same-sex union we're just blessing the good found in it commitment of love and fidelity but the 2021 decision of francis had already condemned that as i just showed it had already condemned that so what they're doing is completely contrary to what rome has said so again they're thumbing their nose at the magisterium saying, ah, we don't like what you said. We're just going to do it anyway. It continues, what content and form that a prayer can concretely take are best discussed by those involved with a pastoral leader? Such a moment of prayer can take place in all simplicity. Also, the differences should remain clear from what the church understands by a sacramental marriage. Well, just simply saying, <clears throat> hey, this isn't a marriage, isn't good enough. That's that's not good enough. For the very reason that the CDF said in 2021, you can't, even, even if you recognize this isn't a marriage, you can't say, oh, well, I want you to bless this good found in it because you can't isolate that from the context. So just simply throwing a bone to, well, we're not calling it a sacramental marriage. It's not good enough. It's not gonna. It's it's like blessing the commitment of a pedophile to pedophilia, and just saying, "Well, I'm not recognizing his commitment to pedophilia as a marriage." Oh, okay. Yeah, good, good for you. You, you want an award for that? What does Chris Rock say? You want a cookie? <laughs> like, okay, thank you for throwing that bone and recognizing that pedophilia is not a marriage. O okay. I mean, I guess that's a good thing that you recognize that, but that still doesn't deal with the fact that you're blessing a commitment to something that's disordered. And so to, to me, it's it's kind of a a red herring to say, well, well, you know, it's not a marriage, and I'm not saying it's marriage. So, okay. So that's the Flemish bishops, and the German bishop here is following suit. Again, contrary to what Rome has determined. It continues the article. Although the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith said in 2021 that the church does not have the power to offer liturgical blessings for same-sex unions, the Vatican has not responded publicly to the Flemish bishops' step. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. That is accurate. Well, <clears throat> let's read a little bit more, and then I'm going to comment on Pope Francis and his uh, potential reaction to all this. Let me step away, grab some more coffee, and uh, see if I can get my voice working a little bit better. <laughs> so give me just a moment here. Like I said, for those of y'all who are just tuning in, I've, I've been sick for about six days now. Um, so give me just a moment, y'all.
<laughs> I just saw this right here in the chat. Uh, did Michael get permission from his bishop to get sick? <laughs> Don't make me laugh because it makes it worse. Because <laughs> the more, um, the more I have to use breath, the more likely I am to start coughing. <laughs> so <laughs> you make me laugh hard over here. I'm probably gonna start coughing really bad. So <laughs> let's see here. Um, <clears throat> Historically, how long did it take, an average, for church to respond to condemn heresies and similar blatant rejection of the church teaching? Yeah. It kind of depends on the uh, the situation, but yeah, sometimes the response wasn't always immediate. And so I, I grant that, you know, you might not have an immediate response. I, I grant that. I understand that. Uh, but what you will have is <clears throat> um, you will have the church responding to it. Um, I, I can't guarantee that it'll be right away, but the church will address it uh, and the church will be triumphant over there. Um, now think of, think of the council of Trent. Okay. Let's, let's look up some dates here. The council of Trent 1540s. Okay. 1545 uh, to 1563. All right. So you had a lot of sessions then. Uh, with Trent, ranging from 1545 to 1563. But notice that date, 1545? Wow. You had the Protestant Reformation going on, arguably, since 1517. I know, I know. Probably not a really good date. But around that time 1520 1521 somewhere around there you've had that going on 20 25 years before you get the church to respond it's interesting with the convocation of trent you know the, the church was trying to get a response but getting the bishops to come together and getting something to really you know ironed out i mean there, there was it was just interesting on the obstacles that prevented the Council of Trent from meeting until it actually did. Um, so yeah, the church will respond. Unfortunately, it might not be immediately. And I'm not saying that's okay. I'm not saying that's okay. I feel like in the days of the internet, um, the response should be the same day, if not the next day. I mean, unless something really needs to be analyzed and and it's a really complex situation i understand you want to take your time with that but in areas that are just really clear cut i kind of feel like in the days of the internet it should be pretty quick now, i don't know what's going on with the vatican they're still sending telegrams <laughs> i kid you not somebody sent that to me the other day pope francis sends a telegram to somebody i'm thinking are you are you kidding me what kind of silliness is this we're in 2023 I didn't even know that Telegram still existed. Like, that's still a thing? Are they recording Pope Francis's speech on an 8-track as well? Like, what is this? <laughs> so when, when the Vatican's still using Telegrams, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure that we're doing what we should be doing as, as quickly as possible in a day and age uh you know of, of the internet <laughs> somebody asked in the chat telegram the phone app no <laughs> no <laughs> not telegram the phone app <laughs> the, the the original telegrams <laughs> i told you don't don't make me laugh i'm gonna start coughing uncontrollably now hold on I'm having to push through this because it's like, okay, after six days of being sick, I'm realizing, okay, I can't keep just waiting to do shows. I'm just going to have to push through it. No, Telegram. Like, let me share my screen, show you this thing. Uh, let's go to Wikipedia for, for those of y'all who are not familiar with <clears throat> a Telegram message.
gonna uh, introduce y'all to something interesting here. Does Wikipedia Wikipedia doesn't even? Are you kidding me? They don't have anything on it. Seriously? Are you kidding me right now? It's so out of date that even Wikipedia does that. What in the world? <laughs> I can't even find something on Google. <laughs> Because it's all pulling up, you know, the Telegram app, right? All right, forget that excursus. Uh, you know, just ask your your great grandparents or your grandparents what a Telegram is. They'll they'll tell you. But uh, yeah, evidently the Vatican is still using Telegrams. Let me let me show you that. Okay. Share my screen. I kid you not. Pope Francis uh, sends telegram for victims of a devastating fire in Iraq. I kid you not. A telegram. God bless him. <laughs> I know he doesn't use like cell phones and everything. And there was that, uh, there was that, um, interview he had not interview but that discussion he had with the kids or whatever and believe me this is all related to what we're doing here so this, this isn't too far afield uh he did that interview on on hulu with those kids and in that he revealed like he, he doesn't even use his phone like if he needs to call somebody they'll basically dial it for him and just handle the phone he he, he doesn't get on social media or anything like that so I kind of feel like um, the Vatican is still in the dark ages when it comes to communication. And that's not good in a day and age when the rest of us are in the real world and we're dealing with social media and all that. Um, I, 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 think, <laughs> I think they could do better. So, yeah, <clears throat> um, let's get back to it, though. Uh let me finish with this article, and then I'm going to comment on, on Pope Francis himself. Share my screen. Okay. In his letter, Bishop Weissman said, Nobody is forced to hold such blessings, but my request also means that no one who carries out such blessings has to fear sanctions. Well, that, that's not good enough for me. That is not good enough. Here's why. All right, Bishop Weissman, is it okay for you to tell your priests it's okay for you to bless the commitment of a pedophile to his pedophilia relationship with an individual? Is it okay for your priests to bless the commitment, not the sin, but just the commitment aspect of that relationship? Is it okay? For them to bless that as long as they're just not being required to do it. And in other words, it's okay that they don't do it, but they won't face any sanctions if they do it. Is that okay? W would that work? You would say, no, of course not. That, that's absurd. Right. Right. But by the same logic that you're using to bless the good found in these other disordered unions, I can just use that same logic to say, bless this good. It's the exact same logic. So now you're going to have to tell me why we can't do it in this situation, but we could do it in this one. Why? Oh, because society doesn't generally accept pedophilia, right? Is, is that the difference? Well, what happens when society does embrace it? Will it be okay then? See, you're going to have to give me a really consistent answer here on why it's okay in this situation, but not in this situation. It can't be arbitrary. What moral norms are you using to really guide yourself on this decision, Bishop Weissman? Certainly not biblical or philosophical norms. Maybe it's just the norms of society. To which, again, I say, well, what happens when society says it's okay for an adult to have this disordered relationship with a child. What happens then? Are you going to cave in on that as well? If not, why not? 
Upon what basis? The word of God? Are you going to tell me it's on the basis of the word of God that you can't do that? Oh, okay. I'm going to say that exact same thing to you here. In this other situation, the same-sex acts. So I'm not buying this. This seems like a really uh, very problematic position that he has adopted. And simply saying, I'm not forcing my priest to do this, but those who do it, they just won't face sanctions. Okay. Then you should also be willing to allow them to bless the commitment of pedophiles. And it, it, it doesn't even have to be a sexual sin. A person's commitment to murder. Are you going to bless commitment to murder? You're not blessing the murder itself. You're just blessing the commitment. So somebody wants you to, hey, Father, please come and bless my, my commitment here. I have a life devoted to murdering people. And I, I know murder is wrong, but I'm just so passionate and zealous about my commitment to this lifestyle. So please just bless my passion and commitment here. I'm not asking you to bless the sin, but just my commitment. Is anyone buying this? All right, well, let, let's continue. <clears throat> On the contrary, it is important to me that we give these believers a clear sign of God's closeness in the community of the church. Oh, absolutely. Your, your eminence, I wholeheartedly agree. We need to give people who are struggling with same-sex attraction and acts and who are in these unions, we need to give them clear signs that God loves them and we are close to them as a community. Absolutely, I'm wholeheartedly on board with that. How does that follow, however, that we're now going to bless the disordered union or some alleged good found in this union? It does not follow. Because I can be close to a person and I can show them God's love without adopting this wildly absurd position that the bishop has adopted. Jesus was close to people. Jesus gave them love. Jesus showed people God's love. But Jesus also said, go and sin no more. That's part of the message, too. And I feel like that's missing from the German bishops and the Flemish bishops. Where is the go and sin no more part of their message? It doesn't exist. You'll search in vain. So it doesn't sound to me like a true commitment to showing them God's love. If you really love people, you'll tell them the truth. I'm not saying you have to be a jerk about it. I'm not saying you need to be obnoxious. I'm not saying that you need to just condemn people. I'm not saying that. No. You can be welcoming to a sinner while not welcoming their sin. Jesus welcomed sinners. He did not welcome their sin. And likewise, that is how I want to be treated. I want God to welcome me, but I don't want God to welcome my sins. If somehow now God is on board with my sins, there's a problem. I can't really trust God. Because if he compromises on morals, what else will he compromise on? Maybe love for me? Maybe his own word? Maybe his own promises? If God can give a head nod to sin, he can change anything. And I can't really trust him. So I want God to welcome me, but I don't want God to welcome my sins. He continues. It may be that the domestic setting, possibly also with the blessing, uh, with the blessing of the shared apartment, is more suitable for receiving a blessing. A blessing ceremony can also take place in church or, or at another suitable location. Well, okay, let, let's just again, let's just plug in another sin here uh, and reread it. Okay, so in the case of you know, unions centered on pedophilia. Could the bishop say, on the contrary, it is important to me that we give these believers, these, these you know, believers who are struggling with their 
pedophilia unions, these believers, a clear sign of God's closeness in the community of the church. It may be that the domestic setting, possibly also with the blessing of the shared apartment, is more suitable for receiving a blessing of the good found in a pedophilia union. A blessing ceremony can also take place in the church or at another suitable location, end quote. <laughs> it becomes a joke whenever you just substitute this for something else. It, it becomes a joke at that point. It doesn't work. So, all right, let's see. <clears throat> it continues. The 63-year-old bishop said that until the German bishops' conference completed the handout, pastor, uh, pastors should refer to a 52-page publication called The Celebration of Blessings for Couples produced by the AFK, an association for family education and pastoral care. More than half a million Catholics formally left the church in Germany in 2022, the highest annual figure on record. Hmm. Think there is a connection? I think there is. You know what my theory is? I think it's likely the case that some German bishops are seeing the fact that their churches are empty. And they're also seeing that secular society is pushing for the embracing of homosexual unions. And they want people to come back to church. And they have this idea that somehow if the church blesses some good found in these unions, that people are going to come back. <clears throat> Let, let's come back to reality. Okay? I'll tell you this right now. If I were in a same-sex union, I would spit in the face of any bishop or priest who told me, I'm only going to bless the good found in your union, but not the bad. If I'm an unbeliever and I'm living in this, I would spit in their face. I would say, how dare you insult my union? How dare you? Right? It's ridiculous that we think that somehow throwing them this bone is not going to be an insult to them. Of course they're going to be insulted by this. They're going to say, this isn't good enough. Oh, so you just want to bless the good found in my union? Seriously? They're not going to come back to church. They want you to wholly embrace their union fully and wholly. The entirely, the whole thing, anything short of that is going to be condescending to them. Anything short of that is going to be an insult to them. So you either have to stand firm and say, look, we welcome you, but not the sin. And you have to stand firm on the issue that this is a sin. And at that point, let the chips fall wherever they may. You either have to stand firm on that, or you have to entirely cave in and say we're going to bless this entire union and consider it even a marriage it's one or the other you can't have this little halfway house because they're not going to accept that nobody is going to feel anything less than insulted by such a blessing people want their unions to be recognized and they want the church's approbation, and ultimately they want God's approbation behind them to alleviate their conscience. Their conscience is screaming out at them, telling them this is wrong. Their conscience is telling them it's wrong, and they want some relief. And just simply telling them, hey, I'm going to bless the good here, but not the bad in it. You're not really giving them what they're looking for. And rather than give them what they're looking for, give them what they need. It might not be what they want, but it is what they need. They might spit in your face, but it's what they need. And you know what? Some people will turn away from their sin whenever the church says, we welcome you, but not the sin. Whenever you stand firm, they'll say, you know what? I need to turn away from this. It continues. 
More than half a million Catholics formally left the church in Germany in 2022, the highest annual figure on record. According to the German Bishops' Conference, the Diocese of Spires serves 465,000 Catholics, 19,000 of whom are mass goers. <laughs> Stop. Are these, <laughs> are these numbers, Zach? <laughs> Hold on. Oh, boy. Um, 4%. Wow. Goodness. We got some work to do in Germany. Um, okay. The diocese recorded 3,000 baptisms in 2022. 3,300 Holy Communions, First Communions. 2,100 Confirmations, 730 Weddings, 6,300 Funerals. Uh, it also saw 11,000 people leave the church while 34 joined, 30, 34, and 112 formally returned. The diocese had 34 people join. I've seen parishes that have brought the gospel to more than 34 people. Wow, that's interesting. Okay. And I imagine <clears throat> the bishop thinks that by making this move, these numbers are going to go up, but that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because, again, people in society are just going to laugh at this and say, this isn't good enough. No, I want you to recognize the union itself. I want you to call it a marriage, and I don't want you saying that there's anything bad with the union. I want you to treat it exactly as you would a heterosexual union, a heterosexual marriage. I want you to treat it the exact same standard. If you don't do that, I'm not interested in anything you have to say. And frankly, even then, even then, people who are generally very much committed to that lifestyle are not going to be that interested in what the Catholic Church is doing. This is not how to reach people. You know how you will reach people? Telling them the good news about Christ Jesus. But the good news only makes sense when you understand the bad news first. The good news is Christ Jesus has atoned for our sins and can liberate us from sin. The bad news is that we are currently fallen. We are turned away from God. We're living in a disordered fashion. Our wills are bent against him. And we need to turn away from the path of destruction because we are on a path of destruction. And here's the consequences of a path of destruction. Only then will the good news make sense. You can't tell people about the good news until they know the bad news first. If you're telling people about the good news and the bad news, that is going to win people to the church. Otherwise, people just, they're not going to care about the Catholic Church. Why would they? If I was not a Christian, I would not waste my time with the Catholic Church if it wasn't for the message of the good news of Christ Jesus in light of the bad news. I wouldn't waste my time. I would rather do something else. I would, I would, why, would I, why in the world would I want to go to church? Do you know how many other things there are that I could be doing with my life? And you want me to go and be involved in a church? Why? It's like a million other things I could be doing with my life. And I have only one life to live. Why would I waste my time with this stuff? Well, the only reason why I would waste my time with this stuff, and it's not a waste of time in light of the truth, is because there is the bad news. There is the path of destruction. But there's also the good news that we have in Christ Jesus where we can receive eternal life in him. The repentance from sin and trust and faith in Christ Jesus and obedience to him, obedience to his commands. You have eternal life. That is why people will come to church, not all this other stuff. So, eh, I think the bishop is missing it. Wiseman promised, um, Weissman promised to respect the consciences of pastors who opposed, let me see, who opposed the blessing. But he asked them to refer couples to the diocese and office, which he would put them in touch with, uh, with another pastor in the region. Okay, so again, let, let's just substitute that. You know, if there's a priest out there who doesn't agree with blessing, you know, ped pedophilia unions. Okay, well, you know, you're not going to be censored and you're not going to have to be forced to bless this good found in pedophilia. But just refer those people to the diocese so we can put them in touch with another pastor who will do that. Do you really think that that's going to be a solution? 
the people who are going to turn this down, the priests who are going to turn this down are not going to refer these people to the diocese and office because they're going to say this violates the moral norms of the church. The only, that's the only reason why they would object to this. Otherwise, they're not going to object. This is no solution. He asked pastors willing to offer blessings outside their pastoral care areas to contact the office so that a list can be created and distributed. Many couples' prayers for blessing reveal a deep longing to be able to live their lives together under the protection and guidance of God. Okay. All right. I have no problem with blessing people, individuals, <coughs> with a intention of helping them live a holier life. That's not a problem. The problem is when you bless the union as a whole or part of the union, some goods found in the union. That's the problem. But notice how he couches it. Instead of how it really is, he couches it and disguises it under this language. What is evident here is a longing for God that goes beyond boundaries that have been drawn so far. You mean boundaries that God has drawn. Just say that. Just be explicit, your eminence. These are not boundaries that we have drawn. They are ones that God has drawn. He says this is to be taken seriously and points to the biblical promise of God's presence wherever there is goodness and love. Ah, yes. The only time we ever talk about the Bible is when we talk about God's love. But we miss all that other stuff in the Bible that talks about turning away from sin, that talks about eternal damnation, that talks about the suffering that comes from a life of sin. We miss all that stuff, but we talk about God's love and goodness. That's when we talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm. He added, with the possibility of blessing celebrations, we want to do justice to both God's mercy and the situation of people. Uh -huh. Okay, here's their situation. The situation is they are sinning against each other, and they are on a path of destruction if they do not cease to sin against each other. So if we really want to reach them with God's mercy, we have to tell them, turn away from sin and God will be merciful. Here's the thing, though. God is not merciful when you tenaciously adhere to your sin. God's not merciful then. God is merciful when you say, I turn from my sin. Please have mercy on me. But if you say, no, I'm going to hold to my sin. I'm not going to turn away from it. God is not merciful. He says, Okay, I will let you do that. And now you're going to suffer the consequences of your own behavior. Which is which is death, destruction, wrath, all of those things that the Bible talks about. But mercy is available to everyone always on the condition that they turn away from sin. So if we really want to reach people with God's mercy, we'll tell them turn away from sin. He continues, let us take this path together and remain in dialogue. Um, you know, I don't have an issue remaining in dialogue, but this is silly as far as this path togetherness stuff. No. No. Uh, I'm not buying it. Remaining in dialogue, dialoguing with people, sure. Absolutely. Compromising on the faith, talking about blessing some good found in a disordered union. That's all just silliness. Okay, so obviously Pope Francis needs to respond, right? There needs to be some kind of response at this point because they are explicitly thumbing their nose at the magisterium, at Pope Francis, explicitly. What's going to happen? I have some thoughts here. Let me step away one more time. <clears throat> And um, get a little bit more coffee, and we'll wrap it up. Give me one second.
All right. Any guesses what coffee brand Michael drinks? <laughs> uh, the the Walmart brand. I think it's like great value or whatever. <laughs> y'all need y'all need to get me some Mystic Monk coffee or something. I get the cheap brand. <laughs> I'm, I'm a cheap coffee drinker. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I've often been very puzzled by this pontificate. Not just this pontificate, but also Benedict's pontificate, John Paul II's pontificate, Paul VI's pontificate. I've been so puzzled by them. I've, I've wondered, why is it so hard to discipline people? Some of the appointments that John Paul II made were very concerning. Obviously, personally, he is a saint. Sure. As far as his pontificate, there were some rough spots with some of the appointments. Un it seems like some people got away with murder. Under Benedict, some people got away with murder. And also some bad appointments. What's going on there? Bad advisors? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know. <clears throat> don't know. You, you would have to ask them. Your guess is as good as mine. But I'm always, you know, scratching my head like, what, what's going on there? But then again, I've never been Pope. So I could be missing something. But I've noticed people getting away with murder. Not that in the preconciliar period, oh, people didn't get away with murder. And then, oh, well, no, there are plenty of instances where people did get away with murder. Um, and discipline wasn't as strong as it could be. But at the very least, I'm in this contemporary period, and so I'm just looking at this contemporary period, and I say, wow, it's not just with this pontificate that there sometimes is, is not as much discipline that there should be, but with even previous pontificates, what, what's going on there? I don't have a good answer because I, I don't know. In, in my opinion, I don't think it's very hard if one were Pope to just say, Hey, I'm relieving you from ministry and we're going to put somebody else in place. Like what, what's so hard about that? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something because I'm not Pope, but it just seems to me that the one who has ordinary immediate jurisdiction would be able to just say, look, Hey, if you're going to do this, you're out. Goodbye. I'm going to put somebody else in there. Now, I totally understand you don't want to just be really quick to pull that trigger because there's always two sides to a story. Maybe there's something that you're not considering with a particular bishop. I understand. But at some point, that trigger needs to be pulled. And I've wondered, okay, well, guys like Vigano, they get away with murder. The guy's literally a set of a contest, trashing the Pope every, every day, constantly slandering him. And he hasn't been laicized? What's going on there? Or German bishops releasing statements, thumbing their nose at Rome. What's going on there? Now, obviously, there's a difference between disciplining one bishop versus a whole Episcopal conference. I get it. But the point is, it can still be done. Why isn't it done? I don't know, because why aren't regular individual bishops on the chopping block? Why do they get away with murder? I don't know. Some people on the left that I think should not be in ministry and should have been disciplined long ago. I'm always wondering, why haven't they been disciplined? What's going on there? I don't have a good reason for that. I've tried to understand Pope Francis. Now, of course, I've even tried to understand Benedict and John Paul II and others on this particular point, but I haven't seen a whole lot there. I did come across something from Pope Francis that gave me a little bit of insight into him. 
on this particular question of why not enough discipline. Pope Francis, I did a video about this where I go through this interview that he gave on an airplane a few years ago. And they were talking to him about excommunications. And there was something really interesting there. Pope Francis, he's like, look, excommunications, we, we need to just, you know, these are poor children of God, poor people of God. They're just wayward. Enough with the excommunications. We need to just accompany them. Enough with the severe hand. They're just poor children of God who are misguided. Enough with the excommunications. And I'm thinking, oh, all right, well, that applies to some people. Sure. I mean, like there's some people who are of goodwill. They might be doing something wrong, but they're of goodwill and they're just misguided and they just need some guidance. So, yeah, there's no need to just pull the trigger and excommunicate them. We, we need to help them, right? We, we need to just offer them some guidance here. And that could even include a bishop. Okay, well, I, I could see that for some some people. But what I thought about Pope Francis's words there, what was conspicuous to me was, I, I guess I'm not so optimistic about everybody. I guess I don't think that everybody is of goodwill. I guess I don't think that every individual is a poor child of God. There are some people who are children of wrath, according to the Bible. There are some people who are children of Satan, according to Jesus. There are some people who do not have good intentions. There are some people who do not have goodwill. There are some people who are more than misguided. They're intentionally misguiding. Now, in those particular cases... You can accompany them all you want. You can help them all you want. They very likely are not going to turn away from the path of destruction. And in the process, in the meantime, they're going to bring a lot of people down with them. It's like gangrene, right? Unless you chop it off, it's going to take the whole thing. It's going to take the whole body. It's going to spread like a cancer everywhere. You need to chop it off. At some point, there are some people that you can no longer say, oh, poor children of God, we just need to come. At some point, you have to say, no, this isn't a child of God. This is a person who's following Satan. And this isn't a person who's of goodwill. They're intentionally misguiding. They're intentionally causing destruction. At some point, you have to make that judgment. When there's enough evidence. Now, I'm not saying that we just immediately jump to that conclusion. You have to give people the judgment of charity, can engage in rash judgment, all of that, I wholeheartedly agree, as y'all know. I say that all the time. But at some point, you can be morally certain that a person is a bad actor and that they're not of goodwill. Now, have we come to that point with some bishops? Have we come to that point with some Episcopal conferences? If so, how do we handle that? Do you replace an entire Episcopal conference? Maybe. Might that be difficult? Perhaps. But might that be what's necessary? If you have to, you know, if, if you have like gangrene on your arm or whatever, you might have to amputate, right? Otherwise, it's just going to spread everywhere. Now, I'm, I don't know a whole lot about medicine, but that's the way I understand it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's going to spread everywhere. Paul even talks about this in the New Testament. So what do you do? You have to take an extreme measure. You amputate the arm, right? Unless, if, if you don't do that, it's going to spread to the rest of the body. So you have to amputate it. Now, amputating an arm sounds horrible. It sounds difficult. Yeah, of course. But it's better than the alternative. So replacing an entire Episcopal conference at some point might be necessary. Now, I get that might be difficult. I get that. That might be hard. I understand that. But it might be better than the alternative, and that is for an Episcopal conference to go wild and mislead a lot of people. At some point, we have to do something.
at some point you have to cut people off. At some point you have to say no more. This is what St. Paul teaches in the New Testament. What Paul did is for the man who was sleeping with his stepmother and bragging about it in 1 Corinthians, he shames the Corinthians for not having excommunicated them and says, you need to cut them off. Cut them off from the body. Why? To be mean? No, not to be mean. Was Paul saying, oh, poor children of God, enough with the excommunication? No, he wasn't doing that either. But he also wasn't trying to be mean. Why did he excommunicate them? For the purpose of his own salvation. He said, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that he might be saved. And guess what happened? They did excommunicate the man per St. Paul's request. And that man turned away from his sin and came back into, into communion with the church. And that's addressed in 2 Corinthians. And he's received back into the fold because he turned away. But if we don't excommunicate a person who is obstinately in sin, we're giving them license to sin, and we're not doing them any favors if we just say, oh, poor children of God. That doesn't apply here. We're not doing them any favors. We're harming them, in fact. So we can't say, ah, oh, poor children of God to every individual. At some point, you have to say, look, this is wrong. And you need to turn away from that. And here's the consequences until you do. I So I don't know if we're coming to a point that Pope Francis will need to replace an entire Episcopal conference. I know not everyone in Germany has approved of this. I understand that. Not every bishop has. But many have, as we've seen. Same with the Flemish bishops. Um, is Pope Francis trying to wait for them to come around through more dialogue and discussions behind the scenes? Maybe. But... Are we maybe past that point where dialogue and discussions are no longer going to be productive with such individuals? I don't know, because I'm not there to know the discussions between Rome and Flemish bishops and Rome and German bishops behind the scenes. I don't know. So I'm not in a position to evaluate the productivity of trying to help some of these bishops come along and see the error of their ways. I'm not there to know how severe it is and how obstinate some of them might be. But what I do know is this. I do know for the rest of us on the outside looking in, it doesn't look good whenever German bishops and Flemish bishops get to thumb their nose at Rome and there's no public reproof after they do so. That much I know. Pope Francis has said some things here and there. I totally get it. He said we don't need another um, reformation in Germany. We already have one Protestant church in Germany. We don't need another. Okay, cool. But I think we might need more than that, especially in light of the fact that now a German bishop is saying, and now I'm giving a green light to this. So whatever may be going on behind the scenes, trying to work with people, trying to help bring them along, trying to help bishops turn away from this before it leads to an excommunication or a removal from ministry or a replacement of an entire Episcopal conference, whatever may be going on behind the scenes, however productive that may or may not be, what I know is for the rest of us on the outside looking in, it just doesn't look good because it looks like people get to say, I don't care what Rome says, and I can get away with murder. And I say that not only about the German bishops, I say that about Vigano and others. They get to slander the Pope. They get to say the Pope isn't even the Pope, and they still get away with murder. They still get away with it. It doesn't look good. It looks like you can do whatever you want, and there won't be any discipline. I think something will be done. I don't know if it will be as severe 
as it needs to be. But I think Pope Francis is going to do something. He can't just let them completely ignore Rome. He has to do something. Will it be replacing an entire Episcopal conference? That I don't know. But I think he'll do something. But what I think he should do is any bishop, after discussions with them, after trying to help them see their errors, if they're still obstinate and saying, no, I'm going to still proceed with this, they should be removed from ministry. That's my opinion. They should be removed and replaced, no, no matter how difficult that is. And so that's what I'm hoping is going to happen. Obviously, my first hope is that people would repent and turn away from sin. So Bishop Weissman and others, obviously, my first hope is they will turn away from sin and they will turn away from this harmful approach that they have. That's number one. But if they don't do that, my second hope is that Pope Francis will remove them from ministry. I don't know if that process is already going on behind the scenes. I have no idea. I'm not privy to any of that. But I do know the situation like this cannot continue to go on the way it does. Is Pope Francis waiting for the end of the synodal process to give more opportunity for dialogue? And then at the end of it, he's still going to continue to say no and then expect people to be on board and the German bishops to get in line. Is that maybe the plan? I don't know. I don't even know if that is the plan, if that's really effective. Because uh, frankly, I don't think that the German bishops are going to change even in light of that. So... I don't see that even being productive. I know Pope Francis's approach and style is let's dialogue. <clears throat> you know, he, he wants to avoid severe discipline and stuff like that. I understand. He wants to dialogue with people, help them see the truth. I get it. But can you really dialogue with some of these people or are they already have they already decided what their position is and dialogue is just a waste of time? Anyways, um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there was anything else I wanted to cover. I think that pretty much covers it. If y'all have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll answer some of those. Uh, make sure to put them to at Reason at Theology. I'll give y'all just a second to put them in the chat. We'll step away for a second while I wait on y'all to send some questions and I'll take some of those and then we'll wrap, wrap up the stream. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> St. Peter, the rock there in public sin, it's time, uh, time for excommunication. Yeah. Again, I mean, Pope Francis seems to be of the position that we need to exhaust opportunities of dialogue. And all right, well, with some people, people who are of goodwill, that will be helpful. You dialogue with them, they'll see their other ways and they'll come around. That's helpful. With some people, however, that's not going to be helpful. Dialoguing with them will not be helpful. At some point, you have to say, okay, dialogue is no longer going to work with this person. You need to step it up with it, with church discipline. You know, you, you have to use the rod at some, <clears throat> at some point if uh, words don't work. So dialogue, discussions, that works with some people, but not everybody. How's the dissertation coming? Slowly but surely, but it's definitely coming now that I finished my book, um, I'm dedicating myself specifically to it. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm being much, much more productive. Uh, Michael, do you think the German bishops would, what do you think the German bishops would have to do in order for the Pope to actually discipline them? Oh, that's my question. I mean, because again, if you can be Archbishop Vigano, not only slandering the Pope constantly, but also literally taking a set of a contest position, adopting the view that Pope Francis isn't the Pope. It's like, okay, what can you do to get disciplined these days? The guy can literally reject that Francis is the Pope and he hasn't been laicized. Let that sink in. Now, obviously, he doesn't have any ministries right now. He doesn't have a diocese. He doesn't have any ministries. I understand that. But he's still Archbishop Vigano by title. Why hasn't he been laicized? I don't know. What does it take to be laicized? How is it that he's still Archbishop? Again, he doesn't have a diocese, but he's still entitled Archbishop. Still on paper within Catholic communion, even though privately, or at least personally, he is in schism. I So what do you have to do these days to actually get disciplined? It seems like, again, people can get, get away with murder, and that's that's not okay. You don't ever want to give people the impression that they could just do whatever they want, especially German bishops. You never want to give them the impression that they can completely thumb their nose at the magisterium. Uh, why do you think dissenting bishops stay in the church? They clearly have issues with, why don't they excuse themselves? Is it a power thing? Some people have speculated that obviously there's a lot of power that comes with being a bishop. Uh, so let's say you don't even believe in God anymore, right? Let's say you're a bishop in the Catholic church. You don't even believe in God anymore. Would you give up being a bishop? Let's say you're an atheist. Would you? Now, if I was a bishop, but somehow I find myself being an atheist, would I give up being a bishop? Well, I don't know if I'm already corrupt enough in my heart to deny that there is a God. I don't know if I'm going to have the moral commitment to turn away from the position that I'm in. As a bishop, you have a lot of property, a lot of revenue, a lot of authority, even secular influence. So some people have speculated, well, some bishops want secular influence. Maybe they want to impact the world on a secular level, and they see the church as a good way to, to do that. Even if they don't believe in anything supernatural, they believe that the structure of the church can still do good for society, and so they would use it. Might that be a reason? Um, now, if you're one of those people, do you really think dialoguing with them is going to be effective? No. Dialoguing is likely not going to be effective with such people. Okay. I don't think the Pope can even be even a private heretic. Would that not result in loss of office according to canon law? No, it would not. Uh, if he's a material heretic, no, that, that would that would not. And and pretty much everybody agrees that the Pope could be a material heretic in his you know in his private person. Teaching it is different, but in his private person, materially, not formally, I don't know anybody who denies that. Yeah, the Pope could materially be in a state of heresy. That that's, I think that's undeniable. Um. <clears throat> Okay. Are my books in Audible? Not yet, but uh, stay tuned for more on that. Certainly check it out, though. Um, answering Orthodoxy at Amazon.com or Shop.Catholic.com. Either way, check it out there. It's on Kindle and also paper, uh, paperback. But we'll see about Audible. Mm. Okay. Still looking through the chat. In a New York accent. What's a guy got to do to get excommunicated here? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I don't think that this state will endure forever. I do believe that uh, the Holy Spirit protects even the government of the church. And so while you may have individual acts of um, negligence and imprudence in the governance of the church, like 
considered in and of themselves the act itself going to be that you're, you're not going to have a habitual state as such don't don't in veritatis would would actually actually notes that so you you won't have it to where the church habitually uh, allows these things. Um, so eventually something's going to happen with the German bishops. Either they will turn away or they will just die out <clears throat> or they'll be excommunicated. Uh, something will happen, but it may not be right away. Um, can the Pope be a private formal heretic? I take the position uh, that the answer is no. Um, but obviously that's still different than the question of can he teach heresy, right? Uh, but I take the position that the answer is no on that one. Okay. Mm. I think if other bishops in the world... Uh, world over got together to express their dissatisfaction perhaps it might go away towards some action from Rome I'm not holding my breath though I think that yes that might <clears throat> help put some more pressure on Rome to act quicker it will act the church will act it will not just habitually allow such a situation um, but it might it also might not act as soon as it should um, and maybe such things could help expedite that. All right. Well, I think I grabbed everything from the chat, so that's going to do it. Um, I'm going to meet back here later on, 6 p.m. Central, for another show, so y'all stay tuned for that. And that's going to do it. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. I did a show the other day that upset a whole lot of people about Bishop Strickland and a lot of people unsubscribed, so... I would greatly appreciate some support to help um, offset some of the people who, who uh, stopped following the channel after that video. Maybe go and watch that video, by the way, uh, and you'll see you'll see why people left. But I stand by everything that I said there, so it's going to be what it's going to be. But if y'all agree with the content and you found it productive and helpful, then I'm going to need to hear from you. I'm going to need your support. So start by hitting the subscribe button. But also support me financially if you're able to. So if you've benefited from RNT, I'm really asking you to uh, step it up, help offer some assistance here. Patreon.com forward slash reason to theology or the GoFundMe or PayPal link there in the show note. Please consider those. Also check out my book on answering orthodoxy. Uh, if you have anybody who is interested in Eastern Orthodoxy, especially if they're a Catholic thinking about leaving for Eastern Orthodoxy, certainly check that out. I put a link to that as well in the show notes. All right. See y'all later. God bless. Are you a Catholic thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? Or are you a Protestant discerning whether or not to become Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy and engages all of the arguments that Eastern Orthodox use against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them. I show that they are in error and in fact they're inconsistent because the things that Orthodox are objecting to are in fact found in their own tradition. So the fullness of the faith can only be found in the Catholic Church. Check out the book right now at shop.catholic.com for your copy today.